I'm going to talk to you a little bit about dietary guidelines, give you some information about some of the things. And here's the schedule that they have. Every five years, they put together, our, our federal government puts out some recommendations for how Americans should eat, what we should eat. And it's a, it's a, a very organized process. And the, you, you'll note that uh, 2020, that's when we're supposed to have our next dietary guidelines. They like to have them every five years so that we can stay current with the research, because research happens pretty fast and furious in the, in the nutrition side of things. But if you look in comparison here, um, they're a little bit behind schedule right now with regard. The first step is to identify a dietary guidelines advisory committee. So they look for experts out there. And um, as of this morning, they still haven't started soliciting people or nominations to be on that committee. So they're a little bit behind. And then by 2020, there's a document that comes out. So let's look at the 2015, just real quick, give you a bit of a background here. So the 2015 Dietary Guideline Advisory Committee, this is the group of scientists that presents, they summarize all the research and they give it to Health and Human Services and the USDA, and then they put together a book. But um, this year was a little, this, this, this most recent one was a little bit unique because they were looking at dietary patterns because we don't just eat a piece of bread or just eat, um, you know, we're supposed to eat meals, okay? So they were, they were trying to put things together a little bit more and dietary patterns and how the combination of food affects, you know, our susceptibility to disease and things like that. But... Uh, they recognize that there's variability across food and, you know, different types of pairings and things like that. The trouble was when they came down, they, they gave the usual, we need to eat our more vegetables and that kind of stuff. It's already moderate in alcohol, so not a limited amount. Now it's moderate, so there's some good news maybe. But we increased that. But lower in red and processed meats. And I want you to take and just point this out. See, there's a little footnote there. I'm going to show you what that means. So lower in red and processed meats. That was the bad news, okay? Uh, there's moderate to strong evidence that intake of red and processed meats are bad for us, okay? Now getting back to that footnote. Here's what it says. If you eat lean meats, it can be part of a nutritious diet. So there's a little bit of a contrast there. And if you read this whole document, there's, there's quite a few contrasts in there. And I don't know if you can ever imagine that a government document having contradictory messages in there, but this one does. Here's the finished product. So the guidelines committee sent the, their information to the folks at um, USDA, HSS, and they put together this. And this is what goes out to uh, food educators. This is what the... the um, Student Lunch Program is going to use as a guideline. Here are their five recommendations. And it's pretty cool what they, what they recommended. They've got, we're going to look at whole foods across the whole lifespan. Okay, We're going to recognize that a two-year-old has different nutritional needs than a 10-year-old, that a 18-year-old boy has different nutritional needs than a 54-year-old woman, things like that. So stuff we know in agriculture to be true. Here's the recommendations. Fat-free or low-fat dairy. So they were still kind of hung up on the fat-free stuff. Lean meats are okay. So get your protein source, um, and lean meats are going to be okay. Uh, healthy eating patterns limit saturated fat. Sugar was the new villain, okay? But still, fat, lower saturated fat, low fat was kind of a take-home message. So from there, I don't know if you followed it, but there were some challenges that, the, that came out of the 2015 dietary guidelines. Okay, there was some, some controversy in there. And one of the things, the reason they had such a hard time with meat and processed meats is because they couldn't define what meat was. The experts couldn't define what meat was. So there, there was a lot of, in the different research, uh, in some cases, it would be red meat. Some cases, it would be white meat. Some cases, it would be all muscle foods grouped together. And 
Um, because of that, the American Meat Science, I'm the president-elect for the American Meat Science Association, they're putting together a lexicon of, of these definitions in anticipation of the 2020 guidelines. So what they're doing is they put the committee together, meat terms such as red, meat, white, processed, those are, you know, kind of ambiguous. So let's have a bit of interaction. What? How would you define meat? What's the definition of meat? Okay, yeah. Could meat be anything else, Eric? Okay, then we, we get into also what types of animals, right? Yeah, what's a processed meat? I'm getting... Yeah, variety, it's not a muscle. Yeah, there's, so, the committee got together, and here's, here's, the, here's the definition that they came up with. It's kind of skeletal muscle, okay, muscle attached to a bone, uh, and its associated tissues derived from mammalian, avian, reptilian, amphibian, and aquatic species, commonly harvested for human consumption, edible offal, consisting of organs and non-skeletal muscle tissues are also considered meat. And it took a year and a half to get that definition, folks, because of all the discussion that we had in there why about that. Meat and poultry, as if poultry is not meat. Right. So poultry, meat and poultry, well, it's because we're old nowadays. <laughs> and it's, it's from old nomenclature that the federal government, USDA, used it to classify avian from, from red meat species that we know as livestock. So it's... Um, the egg would not be meat, no. So red, here's red versus white meat. So USDA, this is what I just said, they've used it to distinguish between those two species right there. But in scientific use, we're recommending that we get rid of that old terms, red versus white meat, and we just call it all meat. So you probably you've seen you know, the charts that show consumption of meat. Okay, and total consumption of meat goes up. But in the pork industry, it's been pretty flat since the 60s. Okay, so what drives meat consumption? It's not beef, that's been going down. It's not lamb, it's not, it's chicken. So is that meat? So red meat gets the blame every time we see these population trends where meat's consumption's going up but then they tell us to eat lean meat, like turkey and chicken breast. So it isn't the correlation now, as you eat more chicken, more heart disease goes up? Hmm. Processed meat, what's a processed meat? Okay, been changed. But there's different, maybe there's, we decided there was different levels. So there's minimally processed. So this hamburger is a processed meat. We've just ground it is all. Okay, there's nothing else added to it. So that's minimally processed. So when we see the, that uh, International Cancer Research Group that says processed meat does cause cancer. No ifs, ands, or buts. Does cause cancer. Do they lump hamburger into that? It's processed meat. Or is it further processed meat? This is when you cure stuff. You add ingredients. You add spices. You add... Uh, you ferment it, do all these different things to it. Okay? So you take it from grinding just a little bit further. You preserve it. You know? it's, it's tradition. It's a, it's, there's a whole food safety side to preserving the meat that way. So now we have some definitions for the next Dietary Advisory Committee to kind of hang their hat on okay? so they're not confused. They may still be confused. <laughs> um, here's some examples of some research. First thing... Uh, Dr. Vic Fulgani, this guy, uh, the second author on this paper with me, he's, uh, he's known as Dr. N. Haynes. N. Haynes stands for National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. So it's a survey about what Americans eat you know, on a daily basis. And so from this, we found that children and adults who eat more processed meats, they also eat more whole grain. Kids eat more fruits and vegetables, along with eating more 
processed meat. They, um, what else was in there? The uh, adults eat more greens and they eat more beans as a result. So why, why would that drag along with processed meat? Why would, why would vegetables and whole grain go up as you eat more processed meat? Let's pick on this side of the room. Anybody have a theory? Yeah, you put it on a sandwich. So you've got your whole grain bun, your whole grain bread, and you add the greens to it. They eat more cheese, more dairy. Okay. So this sounds like a pretty good deal that it comes along with there. So maybe we need to change our attitude or people's attitude about processed meats a little bit. Here's something brand new. We talked about the, our first definition of meat was that it had to be muscle that came off a bone. What if we have a synthetic bone and we're growing muscle on it? So we've got a deal like this, a scaffold, and we're growing muscle on it. Snap it off and take a bite. <laughs> we have to define that too. Is that meat? How many think that's meat if we grow it in a lab? We got one brave soul. American Meat Science Association calls it meat if it comes from cells from muscle origin. So in meat science, we have satellite cells, and satellite cells are like adult stem cells for muscle. So we can harvest those, and we can grow them on a scaffold. But in order for it to be called meat, we have to have it from animal origin for those cells, and the final product has to have the same amino acid profile, has the same blah, blah, blah. Maybe you've read about the $10,000 hamburger that they made out of cultured meat. Well, companies like Tyson are starting to invest in these companies to get that price tag down. Okay. So are people going to buy into this, do you think? We already have clean labeling. We can't have any... In our processed meats, we need to have salt, pepper, and things that people understand. Are they going to buy frankenmeat? GMOs are a big deal. Now you have the animalless meat. I don't know. We'll let the market figure it out, I guess. Huh? I can't. Yeah. I, I, yeah, how they define it. There's, there was a big push by the dairy industry for almond milk. To, they want their milk back, you know, that term, milk. So for it to be called meat, that's why they spent so much time defining cultured meat. Okay, it's got all these conditions have to be met. Oh, another big issue was sustainability of the food. So the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, they went beyond just the nutrition value of food. They were recommending foods that um, had less of an environmental impact. So there's a big focus on the Mediterranean-type diet. And as a result of this, some international agencies were out there saying, it's not just about the food, it's about the health of the planet, health of the human, health of the planet that they live on. So one of the questions was, if the reason for the dietary guidelines is for nutrition policy, for nutrition education, is that any place for this sustainability lecture as well? Or should we focus on getting what's the optimal nutrition for people first? I'm not saying we abandon the planet, but certainly the definition or the whole purpose of the dietary guidelines was for nutrition advice in there. So that leads us to some of the controversy with regard in there. I'm going to read this. I took this out of a report that you can find here. And this was just released in November. So in the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee released its report, some of the content received criticism from different stakeholders leading to questions about advisory committees, composition, and membership, and the selection pro process. Further questions were raised about the breadth of the, of the committee's scope, the process used to evaluate the evidence of the science, and the completeness of the advisory work. In other words, it got political. So many of the appointments on the advisory committee, they were believed to be political appointments for people that had an agenda. For, uh, there was overrepresentation of certain trains of thought in there. 
and definitely a lot of it had to do with the sustainability aspect of things. But since then, now we have a whole different political climate, as you know, as opposed to five years ago. So the Consolidated Appropriations Act in 2016 included uh, appropriation to form a committee to look at this whole selection process for the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, and they published this. And that's what that link goes to. So it's not about uh, the content. They're not questioning the content of the advisory, of the, of the report that goes out. They're questioning we need to have a fair and unbiased group of people that represent a broad width of trains of thought in this advisory committee. So some things are going to change there as a result of that. And that is why I believe they're a little bit behind schedule right now. Because this committee, their findings just came out. All right, here's obesity in America. Everybody's seen this graph everywhere. So here, 1980, all of a sudden we see a spike. Boop. And then again here, 2009. What happened in 1980 that might be relevant with regard to why obesity was spiking? Yeah, Mike. Fats out of our, the saturated fats out of our diet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so uh, uh, the trans fats came into play. Um, coincidentally, this was the first year that they released the dietary guidelines. <laughs> this is the first time that the government said, here's what you should eat. And then, bing, in the next 10 years. I don't know what the guys did with their report in 2000, but it kind of plateaued there for a while. But now, here in 2010, and then projected out, we see a projection that we're going to have obesity skyrocket. Very complex. There's a lot that goes behind that graph, isn't there? There's genetics, there's economics, there's um, food affordability, exercise, all of those. Here's another graph. Let's get right to the point of chronic disease. See here, uh, this is the people with the diabetes and the percentage of diabetes out to 2006. We see a, just a huge spike in diagnosis of obesity-related disorders, okay? So here's the numbers. In 2011, almost 19 million diabetics, 7 million were undiagnosed, and now we have a new diagnosis called prediabetes, people that are on the path to becoming diabetic. So if we use those numbers with the population of the United States in 2011, that's almost 50% of the population that's either diabetic or becoming diabetic. Great food advice. Maybe that's part of it. That's a big number. Why is that happening? Why do you think that's happening? Is it just the food? There's Junior. <laughs> Junior sitting around. Is it meat, eggs, dairy? Is it fast food? Is it... Total calories, sedentary lifestyle, all of the above? All of the above. How about this guy right here, the fast food? Let's focus on fast food for a second. So I'm not going to name what uh, fast food company that is, just so I don't get sued. But here's a graph for two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun, large value meal, okay? So let's take a look at the breakdown. These are, these are caloric contents given to me right from that M company, the company that provides this particular meal. So 14% of that total meal, 14% of the calories come from two all beef patties. Look where the rest comes from. 74% starch and sugar. Dietary guidelines, this past uh, go-around, we're recommending looking at combinations of food. So 14% of the calories, 100% of the blame for obesity. Something's weird here. So we're going to take a look at this. Humans, everybody in this room, everybody's got a, a different background. They've got a different lifestyle. They eat different things. They do have different food combinations. Humans are hard to study because we can't 
We can't get away from a lots of confounding factors. Age, you know, it's, it's, it's not uncommon when I review a human research proposal on nutrition where they're looking at uh, getting 30 people in a project that's men and women ranging in age from 18 to 100. An 18-year-old boy compared to a 54-year-old woman, it's not the same thing. They have different physiology. Their bodies react to food differently. So we can control that, a lot of that by using pigs. Pigs are a great model to study humans because they're omnivores and their physiology reacts to food the same way ours does. So we can make dietary changes and see if it impacts their obesity. As people in the swine industry, you guys know so much more about how to eat just because you know how to feed your pigs. You're so far ahead of the game on everything. I was, as I was snarfing down pizza last night <laughs> with uh, uh, Mark Storley, a friend of mine, uh, he said he made the comment that he feeds his pigs better, pays more attention to his pigs' diet than his own. So, I want to, this is the, FAO is the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, so they make a lot of recommendations on behalf of the UN for ag-related type things. And in this report, they put together a, a group of, of experts to look at protein quality. And in this report, they said that they, they, they were reporting what you people know as swine producers. You don't look at crude protein in your ration, do you? You look at balancing for amino acids because that corn, that grain by itself isn't going to have a complete amino acid profile, right, for the essential amino acids. So you bring beans in with it. You bring lentil or you bring pulses in with it. So that combination gives you the essential amino acids. So this group said that iron deficiency and essential amino acid deficiency are what's causing the majority of health and obesity problems around the world, even in impoverished nations. You know, well-meaning people might donate a whole bunch of wheat just to feed people, but we know that grain is imbalanced. They would have to eat so much grain to get their essential amino acids that they're going to over-index on the starch. Then that's how you have poor nations becoming obese. So we should study it in growing pigs. Rats are a poor model, and it's really hard to put ileal cannulas in humans. Anybody want to volunteer for that study? I didn't think so. Either that or you can swallow a tube from your nose all the way down, feed in somewhere around here. Anybody? Anybody? I'll give you 10 bucks a day. <laughs> all right, no takers. So here's an example. Amino acid intake of an eight-year-old boy in Central Africa. So their traditional uh, dryable beans and rice, their traditional diet falls short of the nine essential amino acid groups here, okay? Uh, isoleucine is the one that's near 100% in that diet. So if we're going to help those kids to thrive, we need to balance that. So what we found is we took a, a lesson from swine nutrition, and we can take 55 grams of soy flour now, and we can balance the essential amino acids for that boy. And when we balance those amino acids, lots of things improve. Uh, scores on tests improve. Even um, social skills improve. Less bullying on the playground and things like that. We can get this a lot quicker if we give them three ounces of meat, two different types of meat. We just need to do the research on to see the digestibility of the amino acids and see how processing is going to impact that. This graph is very telling. So if we look at crude protein, the dark green, those are calories that you're going to consume to reach your crude protein requirements in a human diet. So the ones where, and the yellow, that's the calories consumed or the amount of this food product you have to consume to get your essential amino acids. So the ones, take a look at beef, take a look at milk, eggs, even soy. You can, you're going to eat more calories. You're going to overconsume protein if you're just going on crude protein. But if we ate to our amino acid levels, we would have less caloric intake. You with me on that? 
So the crude protein requirements, what we use for humans, is a poor judge of how we should eat protein. I mean, for crying out loud, the UN says, put it on a food label. People have a hard enough time understanding food labels, and we put amino acids in there now. Yes? Probably. I think we'll see that. Um, he asked if we're on the same, where we're going to start supplementing synthetic amino acids for people, too. And I think probably will. We'll have, just like vitamins, taking a multivitamin, I could see people doing that. Or they could eat some delicious food. Man, that's where I'm coming from. It's a lot simpler. Peanut butter. How many of you have just slathered some peanut butter just to get some protein into your kids? I'm guilty of that. Look at wheat. Wheat is a horrible offender. We can get high-protein wheat and reach our recommended daily allowance of crude protein, but we're half the way there for our essential amino acids. So if we're going to get our essential amino acids, we over double our caloric intake. So what do those calories come from? Not fat. What is it? Carbohydrate. It's carbohydrate. It's starch. That's going to spike your insulin. Okay? And you're amino acid deficient. So what would happen if domestic pigs were fed like humans eat? I'm going to show you what happens to them. Uh, pigs' diets are balanced for amino acids. So here's a summary of some research that uh, my friends at uh, University of Illinois did a number of years ago, and it's reported in a, a bulletin out there. So this is just lysine, diets that were deficient in lysine, and this is marbling content. So there's a strategy out there as meat scientists that we did with live pigs where we dropped the lysine out for a period of time, just deficient, not totally took it out. They were just deficient in lysine. And we see that their marbling would go up. Now what's interesting about that is in human diagnosis, marbling is called intramuscular triglyceride and it's sometimes called fatty muscle disease. You've heard of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, same thing except in your muscle, and it's an indicator of metabolic syndrome. Just a lysine deficiency, maybe these pigs are getting metabolic syndrome. But look what happens. 19% out of these studies, there's 19% more external fat than the ones that get a complete amino acid ration. 8%, so their muscles shrink, 8% less. Um, there's almost a 90% increase in marbling, intramuscular triglyceride, and that's a big deal. So let's go back and look at the global population. If they're amino acid deficient, it could lead to stunting and overweight, even in poor countries. So here's a team, there's a collaborative uh, digestibility research project that I'm part of with Dr. Stein here on the bottom. He's uh, arguably one of the uh, most famous swine nutritionists in the world. And we're doing some research to look at how different uh, levels of processing of meat impacts the digestibility of the essential amino acids. So does a rare steak versus a medium well-done steak and a well-done steak, is that going to affect how those amino acids are absorbed in our small intestines? Basically, is it going to affect their nutrition? from a protein quality standpoint. Does fermenting meat, like having salami, uh, bologna, does the processing impact the digestibility? And in some cases, it could improve it. So think about that bologna. It's pre-chewed, for crying out loud. Everything has been emulsified for you in that hot dog, or bologna. So big deal. I used to be the high-protein diet guy, but I'm not anymore, OK? I'm the essential amino acid diet guy. Because think of it this way. Uh, once we do the research, what if we find out that three ounces of pork, three ounces of beef, three ounces of fish a day is enough to get your essential amino acid? You know, if we have a population of, what do we have, eight billion people, nine billion people in the world now? Is it that much? Well, if we do half of that, four billion people eating three ounces of meat a day, that's a pretty good market. You know what? Because the nutrition is there. You don't have to eat a 16-ounce pork chop, a 16-ounce steak. You just, you, we need to get people to realize 
that this is the most nutrient-dense source of high-quality protein. And then the sustainability thing will take care of itself because we just spread it out a lot more. We eat less and get more. Um, glycemic index, real quick. So those starchy foods, that's why a whole grain, uh, it, it has less of an impact on your uh, blood sugar than refined bread. So refined bread is like the standard where your blood sugar is going to be absorbed. But if we have whole grain, the fiber in there holds on to the carbohydrate and you don't spike your insulin as much. So the digestibility goes out through there. So uh, vegetables are very low glycemic because the fiber is going to get broken down and then the carbohydrate gets released throughout your entire digestive tract rather than in the front. So you don't get a spike of glucose and a crash. So here's some examples of low glycemic index and high glycemic index. So a high glycemic index like white bread. So you can blunt that by adding fat, by adding other things to your sandwich. Okay, so a food combination. That's what makes studying food consumption so difficult. Um, according to the American Diabetes Association, there is no glycemic excuse me, index for food because uh, it doesn't spike your insulin. So that should be a good thing. That should be good news. We have our essential amino acids, and it's low glycemic. See? Fat, the fatter the better. Blunts that insulin response more. Again, we don't want to eat a pound of this, a pound of bacon, like some people get carried away doing on their super Atkins diet. So real quick, here's your physiology lesson. This is a muscle cell. This is a receptor for insulin here. Here, maybe it's better if I do this. So here comes, this is all blood sugar. Insulin now is released because of the high blood sugar. It binds its receptor, sends a signal down to these guys. They're going to go up, and they're going to escort all that blood sugar out of circulation into the muscle cell where it's going to get stored as glycogen so that the muscle can use it for energy to walk us on out of here and throughout the day. What happens is if blood sugar remains too high, this muscle cell is going to downregulate that receptor. So it's like having a door with no hole for the key, okay? So you can't get, that blood sugar can't get in the muscle. So if the muscle is insulin resistant, now we've got glycogen saturation, uh, insulin receptors downregulate, and we end up with becoming obese because that energy has to go somewhere so it gets stored as fat. So we call that tissue-specific insulin resistance. And here, about, I got another diagram here. So here's blood glucose. It goes to your liver. First, your liver. Your liver is the, is the storage for glycogen that gets you between meals. So that glucose goes back and forth from the liver. Once it's in the muscle, it's there forever. But it's going to feed your brain, keep your brain going. You need about four grams of glucose per hour to keep your brain going. Okay? So we can get that from broccoli, you know. <laughs> if our liver is saturated, as long as we're exercising, that extra glucose now can go to the muscle. So we're going to refill those glycogen stores because we're moving around a lot, we're working hard, and we're going to keep that muscle viable with its insulin receptors. But now, if we're sedentary and that glycogen becomes saturated in the muscle and the liver is saturated from glycogen, there's no, we're going to get down regulation and we can't put that in there. So that glucose goes back to the liver and it converts it to triglycerides. So one of the first indications of your chronic disease is they measure your blood triglycerides. So now you've got more fat in your bloodstream and your adipose cells still have an insulin receptor on there. So high insulin, high triglycerides, you're eating yourself fatter and fatter. Okay? So your once fine physique is now on its way to chronic disease. So we get fatty liver. Liver fills up. Sarcopenia means the muscle's going to shrink because we can't get other nutrients in there. And we're going to need energy, so it's going to start burning muscle itself to provide energy for muscles to contract. If you do start moving, it's going to send a signal to your brain, hey, muscles need more energy, but they can't get that energy in there. So now your brain says, 
we need to stop moving. And you get chronic fatigue, and you get sleeping disorders. Then you get more obese, and it just repeats itself. Chronic disease, etc. fill in the blank. All right, if that was totally confusing to you, I made a video. So here's Bitmoji Eric. That's me as a young child. And I'm going to eat a, what the average American eats, okay? And over time, oh, where's my deal? Let's see if it'll work. So I'm going to grow. I'm doing pretty good. I had good parents. So there I'm a teenager. Here I am today. But if I keep eating that, I'm just going to end up, see how, how this kind of goes with uh, what we see with uh, population trends in the United States? Okay. So what happens if we do take, here's a week in the life of an average American family. That's what they eat. Okay. Let's just say that this family, they, they filled out the NHANES diet of what, you, what Americans eat in the United States, and they were average. So we get all this information, and we form this experiment. So we're going to take an average American diet and use ingredients that could go in a pig diet, and we're going to replace the sugar with ground beef because the Minnesota uh, beef checkoff dollars are going to pay for it. So we've got the average human diet minus sugar, calorie for calorie, we put ground beef in there. And then we're going to see what happens. So we formulated the ration based on what was in this N. Haynes, this survey, and it looks like this. So it's mostly carbohydrate, and here's some of the ingredients we put in there. It was really tasty, by the way. It was very sweet and yummy. It was like a meal cake. So the pigs had no trouble eating it. And we fed it to them at 4% of their body weight. When we compare it to a pig diet, it's got more fat, so it's more energy dense. Lower in total carbohydrates, but it's very high glycemic carbohydrates because half the carbohydrates were sugar, table sugar. Um, about equal in crude protein, okay? Just crude protein, because that's all humans look at. Higher in sodium and B vitamins, because that's fortified in a lot of the foods we eat. So this is an important part. Lower in calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, copper, iron, and zinc. So very important minerals that we know are important for the growth of our pigs. So here's our objective. Let's see if we could replace the sugar. We used Berkshire gilts that were about 50 pounds when we started and uh, started feeding them these diets. Uh, Berkshires are a great model. They're recommended by the National Institute of Health as a good model for studying uh, insulin resistance and things. So ground beef, replace sugar. So the red is the red meat diet. And this is their growth pattern over time. By 27 days, we start to see a big separation. By 41 days, there's a huge difference in their body weight. And the blue, this is the diet of the average American. They plateaued. This was a three-month study. We had to stop it because it was deemed an inhumane diet, the stuff we eat. So here's some more data. This is the longissimus muscle area, so the pork chop muscle, if you will. Look at this, the red meat. These guys, these gals, they were all females, they never gained any muscle on what the average American ate. Fat depth, they gained a lot of fat. A lot of external fat. This is very telling. Here's our percent muscle. By the end of the three-month study, over 50% muscle. Get down here, we're down below 35% muscle on what the junky average American eats. The crap diet. Picture tells a thousand, wait, well, picture's worth a thousand words. On the on the right side, that's the ones that got ground beef. Normal muscle, look at the development of the sugar fed, the ones that had the sugar in the diet. Misshapen, loin muscle, look at all that marbling in there. In human studies, intramuscular triglyceride. They were, their muscle was resistant to insulin, but it was a good tactic in production to increase marbling. But they didn't taste very good. We tried them. Here's, here they are, 
Here's the, these are litter mates too. Did I say that? Those are litter mates. That big of a difference. There they are side by side. I want to point out, if you look up here to the number four pig, see how it's losing its hair and all this discoloration? That's acne. So the pigs, had, they did, we had to quit the project before they even reached puberty because they started getting brittle bones. Both diets did because of the mineral deficiencies. And the ones that had the ground beef in their diet, they, they, too many of them couldn't walk anymore because they got too muscular and they, they just wouldn't take it based on the bad bone structure. But both of them were, that was the bad news. So here's a femur. So the bone density of the ground beef, the ones with ground beef, that's the bad news. Their bones were less dense in the femur. In the humerus, which is up here, the front leg, there was no, there was no difference in bone density there. So it was kind of specific uh, anatomical location. And we're busy trying to figure out why this is happening. You know, was the muscle competing for calcium? Uh, we certainly saw circulating calcium levels go down over time in the ground beef group. Um, conclusions from this, the ground beef group had more muscle mass, had a higher percent lean body mass. Uh, they had higher circulating CRP, um, which is a, a, an indication of inflammation. And that could have been due to their bone problems. And again, we're following up on that so we can tell that story. Um, ground beef had less fat, they had less thinning of hair, they had less porcine acne, they had less HDL and LDL, less total cholesterol, they had more marbling, if you will, and um, no, they had less marbling and they had a lower femur density. And then everything else was equal. Serum triglyceride, liver size, heart size was all the same. Both diet. Both diet, yeah. Both diet. Yep. Yep, so the addition of meat didn't add any extra mineral. It added more iron, you know, it added the iron, obviously, but it doesn't give you any extra calcium. And it gives you more zinc, but... Uh, but no magnesium. Right. It, there'll be enough, just not, probably not enough, and the combination, just calcium is the, the big deal coming out of here, I think. So from there, yeah. Um, Dietary guidelines, if we look at the evolution of humans from 1980, maybe that's 1980 that we're going there. And, um, yeah, I'll end with that slide. Any questions? We're continuing to do work on this. But yes? A muscle food, I would say. A food of animal origin. Uh, something depends on what you can afford, obviously. So poultry is probably a good source. And one of the research projects we have going on right now, here's a list of, of the different products we're looking at. You see there's no poultry on there, so we're not going to know the uh, essential amino acid digestibility of poultry products yet. Uh, these, these, these food items are absent from the animal uh, research that we've done because they're too expensive to just put in a swine diet. We've got every grain possible. We've got uh, bakery byproducts. We've got all kinds of stuff from animal agriculture, but the whole muscle and the different processing of muscle. But um, I have a three-year-old boy. We started feeding him pureed beef when he was five months old. And so, uh, yeah, muscle food is, it's tasty and it's nutrient dense. Do all meats? Yes. Um, I'll, I'll point out there's an excellent uh, database called the USDA Nutrient Database. So if you Google that, uh, a lot of these muscle food items are all food items. They have a huge list, and some of them go down into detail. of the. They'll do all the amino acids as well, so you can compare them. I, when we do our boot camp, I ask the question, so what's a good source of potassium? What's a food that your doctors will tell you to eat for potassium? A banana. Everybody eats a banana for potassium. Um, so which is going to have more potassium, a 100 grams of banana or a 100 grams of a center-cut pork chop? Well, it's a trick question, obviously. It's, it's a pork chop. And if you look at the USDA, nobody believes me. 
You look at the nutrient database and you can see 100 grams for 100 grams. And we need a fact sheet that show why isn't pork a superfood? Why isn't why why don't we class cranberries for Christ's sake are a superfood? There's no essential amino acids in cranberries. Well, there may be, but not all of them. Well, it's because they think that meats are causing cancer, and and that's one of the things. When I was looking through the 2015 guideline, there's a quotations in the one I was looking at. And I went down to read the bottom quotes, mm -hmm. and it says the reason that whole meats were lowered in the guide is because. The people that are on the committee looked at the whole, at it as if processed meats are causing cancer, mm -hmm. whole meats could possibly cause cancer mm -hmm. too. So that's the reason they lowered the whole thing. Is what they said. Yep. So there's this negative perception. And again, there might be if you're going to eat, you're going to eat a pound of steak, you know, in one setting every day. Too much of a good thing. If I drink too much water, I drown. You know. So again, maybe we only need we need to find out three ounces, maybe, maybe even less. Who knows? Eat an ounce three times a day for that kid in Central Africa. What if we can take jerky, and it's preserved, it's shelf stable, and rather than give them loads of wheat, now we give them some beef sticks. Yes. What um, with, you know, with using the diet on the pigs like you are, it's, it's still not the way our humans are eating yet. What? what are it's you the same thing every day, and we don't eat the same thing every day. So. What is in your research? Have you looked at anything? How often do we have to have the amino acids balanced in our diet? Mm -hmm. We've got to be every time we eat, you think, or can it be daily or every other day? Mm -hmm. I, I see, you know, i just asking what your opinion is, because I've yeah. seen a lot of different opinions on that. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that depends on your your life stage, too. Um, and that's the next study I want to do. I want to do timing of foods, and uh, there should be some crossover for animal agriculture there, too. But are there any nutritionists or dietitians in the room? Well, not swine nutritionists, but... <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, so if we fed pigs like that, if we, if we, so that's that's the other part of my talk that I took out, so I wouldn't go for two hours. But most people don't eat a whole meal. They're they're gonna get a bag of chips, or they're gonna get a Snickers or something. So they're out of whack, and maybe when they get home, they're gonna have a complete meal for dinner. But anymore, people are in a hurry, and they they don't do that. So you're out of whack all the time. And my pediatrician says, well, if you can get uh, high-quality protein in Oscar, my son, if you can get that in, you know, once or twice a week, it's going to all balance out. <laughs> but I wouldn't do that with piglets. No. You know, it's got to be there the whole time. So when my daughters are running out the door and they just want to grab a cup full of cereal, I said, that, you're not going anywhere to pour milk on it. Okay, so you got to balance out that grain. And the, did you know that they, those box tops that, the, that they used to have on cereals for, for, uh, to get school supplies, that they quit doing that because it was vilified that they're trying to push junk food on kids? Cereal? Cereal is now being classified as a junk food? Yeah, I read that in somewhere well, lately. Well, because of the, the sugar spike. Yeah. The, all the sugar that yeah. the cereal, between the sugar added and the carbohydrates from the processed, overly processed wheat that's <laughs> You need to come work for me, Mike. You know, we're going to go on the road. We'll, uh... I'm, I'm working at studying to become a... I work with human, or animal nutrition, and now mm -hmm. I'm working on the human nutrition. There you go. The, there's a big need in it. Absolutely there is. Yeah, yeah. Matthew.
the elaborate amino acids that we need into that process, be it making protein or another metabolic uh, function. The other amino acids aren't there, so the balance is there, so the system can start up, but if it's not, not up to the finish, everything becomes a waste product. Sure. So, if you're going to take synthetic, you need to have, make sure you have the timing right, that it digests and absorbs the same period that the intact are getting there, broken out and absorbed and all that. So they all need the same time. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to have a waste in the system. So our, our smoothie... We, we need to, the science isn't there yet. We just can't take that pill yet. Yeah. Well, no. the ones that, there are some that do have a amino acid balance pill. Yes. And you have to not, that's all you take is that pill for that time frame because it's, so you don't have the, the problem he's talking about right. where you got the, the stuff that has to naturally break down versus the synthetic so that they don't compete against each other. Right. Otherwise, they're not balanced. Nope. Yep. Nope. Cool stuff. Cool. Any questions for Dr. Bird? So if we want to eat like pigs, what's your, what's your main... Um... Well, the, the easiest way... So what do I eat? <laughs> um, you could, uh, I, I usually say think stir fry or something like that because you know that brings everything together and it's convenient usually. So you, you put your little bit of meat in there with the vegetables and add your spices and ingredients so that it tastes delicious. And that's kind of what I say. But there's, there's cookbooks out there now, of, usually they're paleo cookbooks, which is the paleo diet is is you know, what your ancestors would have eaten and how we evolved to be omnivores, but they don't permit uh, beans or dairy products. So I can't jump on board with that because I'm just crackers about cheese and I... No, but you're not a Wallace and Gromit fan, I, I take it. So. My three-year-old boy says that all the time. I'm just crackers about cheese. So, yeah. so the paleo diet, uh, different ones, there's different, I've seen many. There are some different ones that do allow uh, dairy as long as it's organic, grass-fed. Yeah. yeah, the meat has to be wild game. There's a lot of wild game and things. They, but I, I like their cookbooks because it gives you more variety. To, to go with, and it gives you some good spices to put on there, so it's nice. But it's more expensive, you know, to have meat in your diet is more expensive. So to Eric's point, if, if, we, if we are taking home more money, and as people around the globe, as economies move up, people eat more meat and drink more beer. That's just what happens out there, and that's that's my problem, is I drink too much beer with my stir fry. <laughs> so I'm moderate is not right. But, but I think most of our issue is, is the, the soft drink is mm -hmm. the been the killer that what's been popular when I was a kid, we didn't drink soda at right. all. It was a treat. Yeah. yeah. And today it's the drink of choice. Well, even fruit juices, because they're, they're talking about that, too. So even if you have 100% natural fruit juice, here, if you ate one orange, you know, you get that much juice out of it. But you're drinking this much orange juice, which is a ton of oranges, okay? even if they didn't add extra sugar to it. And then there's the whole discussion about how your liver synthesizes fructose versus glucose, or the combination of glucose and fructose, high fructose corn syrup or table sugar, and that's all of the lecture. Thanks everybody for coming out. Carry on the